Okay, so thanks for um, coming into this one. Whenever you have a parallel session, you always think, am I going to be the one with two people? <laughs> uh, here you all are, looking beautiful, so that's great. My name's uh, Ellis Morgan. Uh, I'm a therapist and a writer and researcher based here in London. Uh, and I have a particular um, interest in, um, uh, I suppose, uh, a specialism in, in gender identity, and particularly um, transgender identity uh, in my work. Um, so the origins of this talk actually trace back to another pink therapy conference, the one that Dominic mentioned this morning uh, in 2014, where the, the topic was on trans identities, and there was that panel discussion at the end um, in which there was a pe the, the question of the, the panel was, um, does attraction towards trans people constitute an emerging sexual orientation? It's a very interesting question, it's a very interesting panel. Um, and as a, a gay trans man myself, um, I was really interested in that and because of my work um, as, a, as a therapist, um, Dominic and I were talking afterwards about our mutual interest in that and decided that we'd take a, a little project forward around it um, and see if we could get a, a small or short publication together um, on that topic. So I interviewed um, about 12 people over the UK um, who identify as um, in some way being attracted to, to trans people as part of their sexual orientation. Um, so I'm going to draw on some of that data today, and um, I'm going to bring it together with another body of data that I've been collecting over the last four years for another much bigger project, which is about the emotional lives um, of trans people um, in relation to marginalised experiences. So those two, um, those two collections of data I'm going to bring together um, today to, to make some specific points um, about gay men in relation to these issues. And when I say gay men, I mean both trans men and cis men. So by trans men, I mean people that have transitioned from female to male. And by cis men, I mean men who haven't, <laughs> who, who have always identified as men, always been um, ascribed male since birth. Um, before I get started with that, I want to remind us all of a really um, obvious, or seemingly obvious, but crucial point um, that was made by Foucault that sets in place why this topic is so important. And that's the, the primary lens through which we see gen, um, se sexual orientation is gender. Um, so when, whenever we're talking about sexual orientation, we're always talking about gender. Um, we could potentially uh, divide up our orientations, our sexual orientations, in lots of different ways. And I could talk about being attracted to uh, very confident people rather than shy people, for example. But that isn't the culturally major way that we talk about sexuality. We talk about it in terms of gendered starting points and gendered end points of our desires. And so the important point is that what that means, that if you complicate a gendered starting point or end point, you necessarily complicate sexual orientation. Uh, and now, that's not to say that um, trans people make, uh, make sexual orientation categories fall apart. Uh, that, that isn't the case at all. But it does render them open to scrutiny and public debate in the same way that trans people's genders are of, often open to public scrutiny and debate. And I, I think that complication is actually um, part of the reason why a lot of trans and non-binary people actually identify as queer rather than one of those binary categories of gay or straight. Um, or, or bisexual, um, and it's also why if you go onto Grindr um, and you um, filter by tribes and you filter by the trans tribes, it's actually a whole melting pot of people that you get. You get trans women, you get non-binary people, you get trans men. There's loads of different people that see themselves as potentially on the market for gay male attraction. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing. But um, Actually, today, I'm not going to be talking about that melting pot. I'm going to be talking a bit more narrowly. I'm going to be talking about um, gay trans men, so trans men that identify as gay in some way, and the men that are attracted to them, so gay men that are attracted to trans men. Um, and I'm going to be talking about that uh, in relation to... I'm going to kind of finish up talking about some brief implications for therapeutic work as well. I don't think any of us will have missed over the last, I don't know, five, maybe even ten years, but particularly the last five years, um, that there's been something of a cultural revolution going on in relation to trans issues. Uh, trans people are everywhere. You certainly can't pick up the Saturday Guardian without reading at length about trans people. <laughs> Um, but here we have um, evidence that it's uh, breaking through to the gay world as well. Here's Aidan Dowling, he's a trans man, 
Um, often, and there's a caption there saying, what a man, the incredible journey of Aidan Dowling. Um, and so obviously this is a very uh, affirming article that's suggesting that trans men uh, might well uh, arouse the interests of uh, gay, the readership of Gay Times. Um, and it's obvious um, that that's a, obviously a positive representation, but there are issues as well. Um, there was a, uh, a great BuzzFeed, I don't know if you're familiar with BuzzFeeds that go around um, on social media. There's a great BuzzFeed that, um, where a bunch of trans guys had collated some screenshots um, of uh, conversations they'd had on Grindr. Um, so I'm going to use those as a way of talking through what some of the issues are that trans guys uh, come across when uh, looking for uh, sex and relationships with other uh, gay men. So here's the first one. So you can see that there's some confusion sometimes. Um, and to be fair, there are a lot of cross dressers on Grindr. Um, but obviously, there's, there's a whole negotiation around actually who you are, what you are, uh, when you're a trans person on Grindr. Uh, and secondly, um, we can see there's often heteronormative assumptions as well. So you like guys to, you should like girls, right? Lols. Um, so obviously there, there's an assumption that if you go to the trouble of transitioning, then surely you should be heterosexual on the other side of that. Um, though we were just talking a minute ago and that's contextual. Um, it's not always the case, but that's, that's frequently the way it's seen. Um, and then we've got issues around realness and duplicity as well. So, honestly, if I saw you in public, I'd think you were a hot guy. You'd think that. <laughs> That's nice. I'd fool you. Nice. This guy's being sarcastic when he says that. Um, so, obviously, even when there's, uh, there's compliments, it can be kind of a veiled uh, message that you're not really uh, a hot guy. You just kind of look like one. Um, and then the uh, genitals issue, um, so this person says, you mean you have a cock too? No. I got it, you're a lesbian, am I right? So why are you here on Grindr? Everyone who's here are all guys. I mean they have cock, so cock equals being a man, and no cock equals being a lesbian. Um, <laughs> that's interesting. So, um, what, uh, these, these clips actually don't do justice to experiences of being a trans guy on Grindr, and I can testify to that. There's actually loads of positive experiences that people have as well, and there's a reason why these guys are on Grindr, it's because sometimes it works. Um, but that's, that's not to say there aren't difficulties, there are undeniable difficulties. Um, so I want to draw on some data now to look what that means for the emotional lives of uh, gay trans men. So here's a participant called Craig who identified as a gay trans man. And he said, years ago, my mate said to me, you know, if you had a cock, you'd be dangerous. I think now he was quite right, because I know the physicality I have has stopped me from just going out and having lots of, you know, casual sex, which a lot of my mates do. There's actually only been one guy that's gone, what? No way. But just knowing that can happen is enough to hold me back. You know, I feel like I've painted myself into a corner in a way, and sometimes it feels like I'm quite stuck. So we can see that for Craig, there's a kind of seemingly irreconcilable stuckness between finding um, the kind of sex and relationships that he seeks and revealing the difference of his physicality. Um, but to offer a contrast to that, here's another person, another uh, trans man uh, called James. Uh, these are pseudonyms, by the way. Don't, don't, mind, don't report me to the BACP. Um, uh, when I first transitioned, I definitely had that thought in my head this is gonna be really hard. Like the one thing a gay guy wants, I really don't have. But it's not been like I thought. Like obviously some guys aren't gonna be interested, but lots of people have been quite curious, and some guys even like the ultra queerness of it. And so what's really difficult for Craig, for James becomes a kind of USP. Um, and the ultra queerness that kind of works for him in some gay male contexts. And so you might wonder at this point, is it just that James is lucky and he's come across this group of trans men that Craig's never met before? Or is there more to it than that? And I think to really understand, we need to know more about how Craig and James understand the meaning of their maleness. And so here's Craig talking about how he feels about his gender to put his um, stuckness into context. 
He says, I know I'm trans and I'm not ashamed of it, but I do know, I wouldn't say I exactly hide it, but I don't tell people if I don't have to either. It does change how people see you, and the way I see it is I'm a man, and I don't want to go around interfering with that. It's taken a lot of work to get to this point, and I don't want to give out an invitation to people to see me differently. So for Craig, we can see it's a huge risk to reveal his difference to potential partners. Um, because, because of how important it is to maintain being seen as just a man like any other. That's how he understands himself, and how, it's, it's how he wants to be understood by other people. But in contrast to that, uh, this is what James has to say about how he feels about his gender. He says, I say I'm a man, but I'll qualify that and say I'm a trans man. To me, there is a difference, because I think when you've been brought up a different gender, you see the world a different way, and that's an important part of how I see myself. If someone says to me, oh, I don't see you any differently to any other guy, I think, well, that's nice, but you don't really know me then, do you? So we can see that for James, he has a very un different understanding of his maleness that provides the context for how it might work for him to be seen as ultra-queer by some of his partners. He's not seeking to be understood as just a man like any other. It's important um, to say at this point what I don't think the data means as well, just to qualify what I've been saying. Firstly, I don't think it means that it's impossible to undermine someone like James's gender identity. Just because he sees himself as a different kind of man doesn't mean he can't be misunderstood. I'm sure he certainly doesn't want to be understood as female, for example. The other thing that um, is important to say at this point is that I don't think what this data means is that only trans men with queer understandings of their gender can possibly pull someone or, or pull someone with a, a, a straightforward an identity as a gay man. Um, I think that it's perfectly possible for Craig to find the right guy. Um, who will affirm his, his normative sense of his gender identity. And I think it's perfectly possible that James could fail to come across the kind of guys that would understand his gender. These are just the context that we find these participants in. So no, the point is more this. I think the point is that understanding the emotionality of these situations depends on our ability to understand the specificities of their gender identities. I'll say that again. Understanding these situations, what it means for these people to be in these contexts, sexual contexts, depends on our ability as therapists to understand the specificities of their gender identities, what it means to them to be male. If we can't grasp that, we can't what, grasp what this means to them to be in these situations. I'm going to come back to that briefly at the end, but just to move on now, um, I want to just uh, talk about what I think this means for cis gay maleness. Um, and it's simple, I just quickly want to say that I'm going to be presenting some data from cis, cis gay men talking about their attractions to, gay, um, to trans men. And I want to say I'm not, I'm not inviting well, any uh, judgment about them. Uh, they were actually all very respectful about the way that they talked about the people they desired. Um, I just wanted to show you this little cartoon because I liked it. Um, this, uh, I think this just shows it's an emerging conversation. Um, this is a cartoon that went around last year. This is a really small part of it. But I think that uh, it is an emerging conversation um, amongst uh, cis gay po populations. And when I was doing this research, actually uh, looking for people that were attracted to trans people, gay men were by far the easiest to find, by far. They all wanted to offer their thoughts on the matter. So here's Peter, 50-year-old cis gay man. He said, if you said to me 20 years ago, you're going to end up with a trans man, well, firstly, I wouldn't have known what that was. And secondly, I would have said, no bloody way. I've learned a lot about myself. I challenge anyone who says I'm not gay. You can't look at my boyfriend and say I'm not gay. The difference is now I know what makes a man, whereas I'm not sure that many other people do. So... Um, I think here's a, a really good example of how a cis gay identity can accommodate trans men into it quite unproblematically. Gay, gay identity doesn't need to change if trans men are seen simply as men. But let's look at a contrasting statement to that. Uh, here's David, a 48-year-old uh, cis queer man, and he says, I met the first trans man I fell for at queer camp about five years ago. Before that, I'd always just said I'm gay, but I'm not sure I'd say that now. I prefer dating trans men because there's often less of a hard edge to their masculinity that fits better for me. 
So I think, can I call myself gay? Trans men are men, but I don't think the term gay really does justice to how I feel or what I like. I think queer is better. So um, here we can see that an attraction to trans men can also sometimes lead to the rejection of a gay identity. Uh, simply not complex or nuanced enough to point towards the specificities of desire. Uh, for David, uh, the genders of the trans men that he's attracted to are different in meaning to cis maleness. And so, as a result, he sees the meaning of his sexual orientation made different as a result. One more that's slightly different again is Michael, a 34-year-old cis gay man. And Michael said, when I met him, I just thought, oh my God, he's gorgeous. And then when he told me he was trans, I thought, oh, oh. And it wasn't until we finally had sex that I really fully got it. He's a man. He's totally a man, and a man isn't just one thing. I'm sure I don't need to spell it out, but yes, of course, I find the fact that he's got what he's got exciting. That's a part of it. I wouldn't say it's a fetish. I'd just say I find it exciting. So here we can see that rather than gayness being exactly the same or completely rejected, for Michael, what happens is a sort of diversification of gayness. That there can be different types of men and there can be different types of gayness, even within one sexual orientation as gay. And we can see that when it comes to trans men, that, uh, that difference can encompass an attraction to physical difference as well. So at this point, I want to kind of just briefly offer my answer to the question that was discussed at that Pink Therapy panel that day, which is, is trans uh, attraction and merging sexual orientation? And I'd say, well, it's a bit more complex than that. Um, I think trans attraction um, is featuring more in people's lives, um, and that's because people are more trans aware. Um, but I think it's not a single orientation. I think that what's happening is that we're changing the borders of existing sexual orientations and sometimes creating new or different labels or different configurations for those sexual orientations. So it's a complex picture. Um, so this, um, this is important then to realize these shifts, there's, there's different ways that trans people want to be understood. I need to hurry up. Uh, there's different ways people want to be understood, and there's different ways they are understood by the people that are attracted to them as well. Um, so let's uh, turn to the therapeutic implications. Um, I think at the, the heart of the job uh, that we do as therapists is engaging with the core pursuits of human life, um, pursuits of happiness, agency, meaning, purpose. And we know that when it comes to working with LGBT populations more broadly, identity affirmation is a really uh, critical part of doing all of that work. So what I want to say is this. An important aspect of that affirmation uh, when it comes to trans people is being able to hear beyond our own conditioning of what it means to be a particular gender. We need to look at the different shades, the gaps, the nuances, the details. This is where self-meaning is, and understanding that is the only way we can really do our job properly. And when it comes to gender, this really couldn't be any more fundamental to who we are. And of course, how we see our genders and how we see um, sexual orientations might not be clear to people themselves. We can't affirm something that's not clear to the client. So our work is in being open-minded enough and unfixed enough in our thinking that we can help, we, we can help them uh, think through exactly where they might stand in relation to all of these issues. And of course, we can only affirm and help to explore the sexual orientations of those people whose desires are directed towards trans people if we understand what gender categories mean for them too. Um, so I think the most important thing is that we need to make sure that we don't have a trans blind approach. Uh, and what I mean by that is I think that often the, the the image that we're given by the media is just that if we're going to be inclusive of trans people, we need to accept them as real men and women. And that's really quite a simplistic idea. I'm not, now I'm not rejecting that idea, but I'm saying it's a bit more complicated than that. That um, we don't want to homogenize trans people as being just the same as cisgendered people, because actually their experiences can be quite specific, and their gendered meanings can be quite specific. Um, and so I, I think that in the attempt to sometimes be um, a progressive therapist, 
we can um, be a little bit scared to go there with what the differences might be. And I think we need not to be scared of having those conversations, but make sure that we're aware enough and confident enough to be able to have those kinds of conversations. And we need to firstly, absolutely start from a place of honesty. And I'm not in your head, but I wonder what your reactions have been to hearing my talk today. Is this a new thing for you? Do you, do you think that you, you are an expert in this area, or actually is there, um, is there work still to be done? We need to use supervision, therapy, friendships to reflect on and challenge the way we legitimise our own gender and sexual orientations. Because these things can really be quite challenging. If someone has a completely different way of legitimising or understanding their own gender from the way that we see ours or sexual orientation, we need to, be allow, allow, we need to allow for that difference without feeling completely undermined by it. Um, and lastly, um, we can use supervision as well to reflect on the power dynamic within each specific relationship. So what gender and sexual orientation means within that specific context. Because what we represent as a therapist is going to really change the, the nature of how that affirmation and that exploration unfolds. So, I think I've come in just on time. <laughs> Thank you very much.